Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for uh, our conversation today. Um, as we already heard, today's talk is called Images and Power, Exposing the Challenges of Representation Through Protest Photography. Um, I want to introduce our panelists really briefly. Um, and maybe at, what I was thinking I'd do is I give a brief introduction. And then as I introduce you, maybe um, say like, hello, just so that participants can see you on the screen. So I'll start off with Joshua Edmonds. Joshua is a photographer and videographer. He's a visual media specialist within the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Ohio State. Welcome, Joshua. Oh, thank you. Great. Next, uh, we have Daniel Marcus, who's an associated curator, associate, excuse me, curator at the Wexner Center for the Arts and a lecturer in Ohio State's Department of History of Arts. His research, writing, and curatorial projects explore the resonance between art and social histories with an emphasis on the politics of gender, sexuality, race, and class. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Next, we have Gina Osterlo. Gina is assistant professor in Ohio State's Department of Art. Her photographic practice embodies the printed image, drawing, film, and performance to explore the resonances between the physical body and its representational imprint, trace, or stand-in. Welcome, Gina. Thanks for having me. And last, we have Larry Williamson, Jr. And Larry is director of Ohio State's uh, Frank W. Hale, Jr. Black Cultural Center. He's responsible for the operation of the Hale Center, including the Hale's art collection, as well as developing and directing the center's educational, social, cultural leadership and group activities on campus. Larry Williamson has also taught in our, uh, taught art and photography, and he's a photographer himself too. Welcome, Larry. Greetings, I'm so glad to be here today. Great, so um, I'm so excited to have you all. Um, I know we heard a little bit about the title of the talk, Images in Power, um, and we decided to frame today's conversation through Joshua Edmonds' photographs from the recent exhibition in Hopkins Hall Gallery, um, that was titled One Voice, One Message, Black Lives Matter. Um, the exhibition um, will be on display at the Hale Center in January as well. And Joshua Edmonds' photography exhibition shared just a fragment of the reaction that took place in Columbus, Ohio, following the days after uh, George Floyd's death. I did want to also add um, the exhibition itself was presented in conjunction with a larger project called The Heart of Protest, which was a series convened by the King Arts Complex. And more than 20 arts and cultural organizations in Columbus uh, teamed up for The Heart of Protest, which includes 46 non-sequential days of artistic protest determined by each organization. To um, designed really to honor the 46 years of Mr. Floyd's life and serving as documentation of the global justice movement that is currently underway. What I was thinking we would do for this conversation, I'd like to start with some of the images. Um, and uh, if we can pull up the images as they are on the Urban Art Space website uh, right now, Josh, and then I'll start with you. And I think. Um, I prefer, really, I think the conversation is going to meander. So we might start um, talking about, you know, what happens in May and June, and then we'll talk a little bit about the images and we'll just take it from there. So, um, Josh, that clearly, as you have brought this to us, the Black Lives Matter movement erupted across the world after George Floyd's 46 year old black man was pronounced dead after Minneapolis police officer kneeled on his neck for over eight minutes. Um, this of course, in addition to all the other countless killings of unarmed black people brought people together in historic protests um, and gatherings to address American race relations. Many of these massive protests were also accompanied by harsh law enforcement and government responses 
and were widely covered by the news media, participants, and bystanders. So Josh, at what point um, during the protests that unfolded in Columbus in late May, did you start photographing? Um, I started photographing, I say, literally the day after the first night of protest in Columbus. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, I would say a part of the uh, first night of protests uh, after the uh, George Floyd video went viral. And I was, you know, walking uh, in downtown Columbus and people were starting to gather and a big group was gathering outside the state house. And I saw what was happening. I saw a lot of youth and a lot of uh, young people out there just expressing themselves, expressing the pain and the anguish and wanting to just just go out and that first night was a lot of people just coming out and expressing that pain and expressing their anger. And from then, you know, I kind of figured, okay, this is gonna continue throughout the next day, throughout the next week. Actually, back then I did not know it would continue as long as it did. So uh, the next day I, I went down to the state house and I believe this would have been a, a Friday. And I started uh, kind of participating in the protest. I wanted to be a part of this movement. I wanted to also and express myself as well. And I started to see something that I hadn't seen before. So I started taking, you know, I wanted to document this. And uh, I live close to downtown Columbus. I could just walk there daily and kind of document this and also be a part of the protests. And from there, I saw, you know, people expressing themselves, people organizing and people coming with a purpose. And I wanted to really capture them coming with that purpose and capture just the, the determination over the next, not just days, but weeks that uh, everything went on. And as things went on, law enforcement uh, continued to uh, kind of increase. The National Guard came and things just continued to escalate. And this became kind of just a moment in time in Columbus. And, you know, I always say that this is just, you know, a fragment of what was going on in the world at that time. You know, this was just what was happening downtown Columbus and Columbus's story, but this was happening worldwide. And it's something that I wanted to show. I wanted to show, okay, this was Columbus's part to play in this. So Josh, um... I'm just curious because your photographs, you know, in so many ways look a little bit different from many of the photographs that we've seen in the news from, you know, point of view that um, perhaps they're a little less dramatic and, you know, it's clear that you did not thoughtlessly take photographs of unwilling subjects. So I'm just curious to hear a bit more about who and what you saw and um, if you if you saw others taking photographs and how you felt when you were taking photographs, were you feeling safe? Uh, to kind of start, I, I was feeling safe for the most part, for most of the time I was there. And the time I was there, I was generally there uh, daily from uh, you know five to eight. And that was kind of like the height of the protest when people were getting off work and coming and organizing and really coming with the purpose to, you know, to really say something. And from there, when it came to, and I was on, you know, Twitter at the time as well. So I was seeing what a lot of other photographers were doing, not just in Ohio, but in other states as well. And, you know, and the media as well. And you'll see photos of protests, you'll see photos of riots, you'll see pro photos of lots of things that were going on in different states and everything. And one thing I didn't want to do, I didn't want to put this, like these were protests. These were always protests when I was there. And a lot of the things when you saw in the media was, was not protests. And a lot, you know, similar to what's happening in Philadelphia right now, if you look up Philadelphia, you're like, oh, protests and things like that. You're not going to see anything in the daytime. You're going to see everything that's happening at night, whether it's, you know, in the wee hours of the night, whether it's looting, things like that. And that's where the media comes in. That's what they showed the full time. A lot of the protests I was there, were, like I said, from five to eight in the evening, in the daytime, and people were there with the purpose, then people were protesting. And that's the story I wanted to show. And that's what I saw when I was there. 
And as for the people I saw, I saw the people of Columbus. I saw the people of Columbus and I saw a lot of young people as well, which was, you know, from that first night of the first, uh, the first uh, protest, like I just noticed like, these are a lot of young people out here. Like, and I wanted to kind of showcase that and showcase their energy and be respectful of basically never letting my photos kind of take away from the purpose. Just cause I was also coming from a perspective as a protester as well. I was a protester first and a photographer second. And that's kind of the mind state I had. And I never wanted the photos to take away from the movement and take away from what was trying to be told. Very good. Um, I was thinking this might be a good moment where we jump into some of the photographs and um, we look at some of the more formal qualities in the images. And I'd like to very much invite the other panelists to, to chime in, to chime in. Hi, Joshua, it's, it's Gina. I wanted to um, address some particular photographs. I'm, first, I'm just really interested in how you're using uh, composition and framing um, in your photographs. I see a lot of um, use of the diagonal mm -hmm. and um, this particular image that we're looking at together right now uh, is a diagonal of um, signs that also are stand-ins for shields. And on the shields are um, words, text, uh, spray painted. And we can see the hand quality of the words from justice for Julius, justice for Biana, protect black trans women. And the diagonal continues. Um, into almost an, an, an infinite point in the background. Um, I wonder if you, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, and, and I know sometimes it's uh, not um, maybe so conscious because you've been photographing for so long, but if you could talk a little bit about uh, your use of the diagonal or, and or um, repetition in your images. Yeah, so, I would say the use of diagonal and repetition, more so the diagonal kind of came from my approach to uh, uh, my gear. I wanted, uh, I wanted to capture a lot of wide shots. So I used uh, a 24 millimeter wide angle lens for a lot of my shots because I wanted to show the scale and the scope of everything that was happening and just to show like how many people were out there and how many people came out. And from that, a lot of the shots I got, you know, similar to this was the diagonal. And for this shot in particular, I wanted to get a, uh, a lower angle because I wanted to show, I wanted to show that repetition. I wanted to show, you know, these are the words that are on here and this is how many people that are actually out there. And this particular photo was just, you know, one side of this uh, barrier that was created uh, in downtown Columbus. There is, you know, the same amount of people on the other side of, of them and just all around creating a square barrier barrier and I wanted to showcase that with this uh, photo in particular and uh, and for a lot of the other photos it was it was similar it was uh, I wanted to show that people are here and that they're coming together to uh, express this message and for me as a photographer the best way to express that was through uh, my 24 millimeter and kind of show those wide angles and show yeah you know, once again just the scale of everything mm, thank you for that yeah. Um, could, could you also address, um, I, I noticed that a lot of the images are in black and white. And was that when you were you were the images in black and white originally when you were photographing? Or is that something that you decided after? And, and why? Uh, that was something I added uh, after and uh, while editing. Uh, one of the uh, so I usually don't I don't do a lot of uh, black and white photography. And one of my reasons uh, to do these in black and white and specifically for the exhibit, I wanted to kind of stamp them as a little bit different from a lot of my other work as a moment in time. And for me, the best way to do that was to kind of put them in black and white and give them kind of a, a stamp, not just, you know, in time, but also among my own work as well and kind of differentiate them from that. And that was kind of, that was pretty much my thinking when it came to uh, making them black and white. 
Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, now when, when you were speaking, I was really connecting what you were saying with what um, Marine was also bringing to the conversation in terms of um, how the camera angles that you're using are not the same camera angles that we see that are used, let's say, in the uh, on the news. Um, that your camera angle, um, and we can unpack this later with the with the other panelists, um, perhaps with, with with Danny and and, and Larry. Um, but how you know, I, I, your camera angles are one that they're they're angles of respect, of of, of care, and of witness. And I just was making that connection when you were speaking. Definitely. And uh, to kind of add to that, I wanted to, you know, as a protester as well, I wanted to be respectful of uh, everyone and not saying I didn't shoot close ups, but for the exhibit, as far as like me showcasing the work, I didn't really want to do any close ups. I didn't want to, you know, showcase people in this time of, you know, protest and vulnerability without their consent, mostly as well. And a lot of people, you know, were posting different photos. And I know a lot of, uh, a lot of people were concerned about, you know, police, you know, getting, uh, getting their image online, getting uh, photos of them and using them to, and using it to harass them or, you know, do other things, you know, with the, the protesters. And I wanted to, you know, and as you can see, I blocked out a lot of the protesters faces. Like when I did get some that were in clear view, I wanted to kind of mark them out. And luckily during this time, almost everybody was wearing a mask. So there are a lot of times where, you know, you could take a photograph of someone and be like, I really don't know who that person is at all. It's hard to find. But uh, for, you know, the people that weren't wearing masks or some that, you know, weren't covered enough, I tried to you know, kind of mark their faces with black marks and just to kind of protect them. And, and that kind of came from just, you know, being a protester myself and knowing what was happening at that time. And yeah, I just, I just really wanted to be respectful of the protesters and myself, you know, if I was out there, you know, and there were people taking photos of me, I would want the same. I'd like to be able to see one of the images with, um, with, the, with the marker, with the, with the faces. Um, in we... fact, there, there is a bit in this image. Um, if you look, the, the um, That's right. demonstrator holding, yeah. Black there are some other matter. images, I think, also that are, um, yeah, we'll have to scroll actually a little bit up. <laughs> yeah, you'll see it in one up. There we go. Mm -hmm. Josh, this is uh, Larry Williamson. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm differentiate yourself from when you want to be a protester and then when you want to be a photographer? Was it moved by the aesthetics? Was it moved by the viewpoints? Um, what made you decide to say, I'm going to protest now? Well, oh, oh, wait a minute. I, I see something that I really think that's aesthetically pleasing. Uh, let me go for that because protest art is, is some of the hardest type of art to do based, based on the action. I try to block off time whether it was, okay, I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna photograph for an hour. And then after that, I'm going to join the protests. And, you know, I do that in many cases, not even just with protests. I uh, do that, you know, just to block off time. One, to not give myself too many photos to, to edit at the end of the day, kind of limit myself, the amount of photos that I take. But uh, also just so I can always remember to be a part of the protest and never just go down there and just take photos and then just roll out. I wanted to, participate and now I wanted to, like I said, I kind of started as a protester and then I wanted to kind of archive what was happening. But it wasn't, after a while, it wasn't too hard to kind of turn that off. And after a while, I would go down there with the, whether it was my wife or friends as well. And it's a little bit easier to kind of turn that off when I'm with other people as well. Can we talk about this image, actually the image that we just had up a little bit, you know, I think um, it was really interesting to hear Gina's comments about the lines and the repetition and, of course, the text as well. And now your, um, even the marks, you know, the black marks marking out um, 
part of the distinguishing characteristics of faces become, you know, another kind of mark making in this image. Uh, can we talk a little bit more about that? Oh, yes. Uh, so once again with the marks and this image in particular, I wanted to, to again kind of protect uh, and make sure people are anonymous. And that kind of came, I would say that that was kind of like the last thing I did before uh, the exhibit was going through the photos and, you know, it was kind of a conscious decision on my part, you know, going in for the exhibit and be like, okay, these are going to be up, you know, for this exhibit. I, I don't want these out there and I don't want people, you know, being recognized. So that was the last thing that I did kind of going through and marking faces and I think some people see it as like, oh man, you know, that's unique the way you mark the face and stuff like that. To me, I was just marking the faces. It was just more practical, like, okay, let me just go through and mark these faces. Uh, I wasn't actually thinking about the artistic merit of it at that point. At that point, I was just, I just wanted to, you know, make sure that nobody could, you know, see like, okay, I know who these people are. Now, if you, you know, like friends with these people or things like that, you may be able to recognize them, but I didn't particularly uh, police I did not want them, you know, to be able to recognize people. I guess I want to come back. This is Danny. Um, I want to come back to some of the questions that Gina was starting to pose. And I, I kind of hesitate to call them formal questions because they sort of bear on political questions. So, you know, so immediately um, thinking, you know, maybe just for a little bit um, about, about color and about um, the black and white character of these um, images, just having spent a little bit of time with them and really starting to get a sense of your eye, but also um, of the particular editing that you did around this suite of images. Um, I, you know, it strikes me that like, the there's a kind of sensuousness to the, the black that is the, you know, the, the, um, like even just looking at the the color of the shirt and jeans of the figure in the foreground here, um, it's not like a super um, contrasty black. I mean, there's something, it's a very kind of sensuous gray. Um, and that kind of grayness is what I start to see when I'm looking at photograph after photograph, there's an extraordinary range of gray here. Um, you know, to me, that's, there is a, a formal side of that, you know, but um, it also does something to these images. Um, it unifies the crowds um, in certain ways. Sometimes that is just, it, it kind of gives everyone a uniform, even if they didn't, they weren't wearing all the same color. Um, but I mean, at the level of skin tone as well, I mean, it's, um, I don't want to say it unifies a racially hum, um, heterogeneous crowd because it doesn't. Um, but it is really different than looking at kind of peachy white skin tones and then just the whole range of brown skin tones that were in these crowds. And the way that you see race and the kind of questions that you, uh, these are questions obviously that were political in that moment because you know they're political inside the protests, who's leading a protest um, is it black leadership? Is it, or is this march being led by white people? Like that, those were the questions we were asking all the time, every day. Um, but there are questions that the media asks as well. And I mean, you better believe that this is part of why photojournalism is in color. Um, because like there, are, that question has to be a hundred percent answerable when Newsweek puts up a photograph of a protest, you know, they want to know the race of the people in the crowd, they want to be able to have you know a message about race kind of preloaded, and I love that your your photographs don't do that. I mean, so many of the like the worst habits of photojournalism and the worst instincts of photojournalism are really refused in this body of work. And um, as someone who was there a lot of those days, I don't know if we overlapped or if we were on the street at the same time, but um, I just so appreciate it and. Um, I didn't know what to expect when Marianne said that you had made this body of work, but um, yeah, I really appreciate what you did here. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, kind of, and on that, I, one of the, one of the things that stood out for me and 
obviously to you while we were down there was just everybody came out. Like so many people came out, you know, uh, different races came out to express themselves and stand for Black Lives Matters. And that was something seen in little, you know, pockets here and there throughout the years, but it was just so striking the amount of people that came out in Columbus. And that was one of the reasons that kind of just made me really want to archive this moment in time as well. And uh, on this photo in particular, and there'll be some other photos as well, you know, I wanted to you know, showcase the amount of people and this was during the day and, you know, mixed races all throughout, but also showcase a lot of the leadership. And once again, there's a lot of photos that weren't part of the exhibit because they may have been close-ups or, you know, people that, you know, I just know probably wouldn't want to be shown in uh, a lot of the photographs, but a lot of the leadership were black women. And I really wanted to, you know, showcase it in this photo and then a lot of other photos as well, you know, a good amount of black women that came out. And once again, there was a lot of black women that were in leadership positions, but I didn't want to show their faces because they were very prominent. So yeah, and that's something that was important to me to kind of showcase that. Yeah, pro prominent and, and taking extraordinary risks. I mean, um, it, seeing these photographs, it's really hard to, um, to not just sort of be drawn right back into the, the kind of emotional moment of the summer, of the, especially the early part of the summer, and just like, the, you know, remembering how, um, how just incredibly brave people were to be. Like this photograph, for example, I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier um, about like protest versus riot or versus looting or whatever. And that, that distinction obviously maps a kind of spectrum of legality and illegality, you know, protest, legal, good, riot, illegal, bad. Um, what you're seeing here though, and what the viewers um, at home are seeing is something that like in my years in Columbus, I've been here for about five or six years. Um, you know, these are, these are protesters marching in the street. Marching in the street in Columbus is not technically a thing that like the police let you do. <laughs> like this is, um, this is not risk-free at all. And um, this was a, a, of all of the things that felt new about um, the, the movement sparked by George Floyd's death. I mean, this was new that like day after day for hours on end for the entire day into the night, you know, you could be in the street. Um, it's also just hard to kind of reconstruct the, like how meaningful that was to so many of us who'd been at home kind of bottled up, just being like in the street like for hours <laughs> with other people, um, just incredibly um, potent. And I love that these photographs, you know, they, they have an ease with their positionality. They are like not in the street in order to get that, that shot of, you know, a protester flinging a, um, a tear gas canister back or, you know, all of the, all of the stock images of protest photography. These photographs plant you in the street and you feel like being in the street is a completely reasonable democratic thing to do. Like this is not a, this is not a, you know, an illegal, um, reprehensible, um, uh, you know, activity. And um, that's, it's just so powerful. I mean, we can't do this right now. Like if we went and tried to do this, um, the, at some point in the late summer, CPD um, made it very clear that they weren't gonna tolerate people in the street anymore. So this is special even just on that sort of micro level. I wanted to kind of take a moment to a uh, question just came in um, about the role that you and other photographers may play during protests. Um, and, and if you can expand on thoughts really about like this is for everyone really, um, your, you know, basically artists roles or photographers roles, you know, during these events, during protests, um, you know, what role does photography play in documenting um, some sort of truth or providing a truth or an accountability perhaps? I would say so, and this is my perspective, and there were, from time to time, I would run into other photographers. From time to time, I would run into a lot of videographers, a lot of uh, independent media, you know, getting footage for 
whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, and I believe as far as photography goes, the more photographers there were, the better. It's because once again, this was just a fragment and I kind of concentrated on the downtown outside the state house area. And I knew things were so happening in the short north, you know, on campus, uh, OSU's campus as well. There were a lot of uh, protests going on just all around Columbus and I can't be everywhere at once. And so there, I'm sure there's photographers that captured other things that were going on. And I think that's important to kind of see what else is going on just because this was, these were the things that I saw but it doesn't take away from the things that anyone else saw or any, you know, other photographer, what other photographers captured. And we need those pieces to the story. This is just a fragment of a piece to the story. So we need, you know, all those, you know, pieces captured to tell the full story. So piggybacking on that a little bit, really then, and this is, this is for all the panelists, you know, in terms of I don't, photography's role in crystallizing opinions, you know, it was really beautiful, Danny, to hear you talk about, you know, kind of reliving um, the protests through these images and kind of understanding or yeah, having these images reference back to the general sentiment that was there when you were walking together. Um, you know, of course, there are different kinds of images, all sorts of images that flow through the media. And, you know, again, your images, Josh, are incredibly, you know, beautifully done compositionally and respectful. Um, so in terms of crystallizing opinions, wh where do you think these images sit? And, um, you know, how do we when you took these images, were you, what were you thinking? Were you primarily thinking of this from, you know, kind of a documentary perspective or were there other reasons um, that you decided to photograph? So uh, I was thinking there were two main reasons. So uh, first was uh, from a doc documentary uh, perspective, you know, trying to archive and just have this moment uh, photographed. And the second reason I use photography a lot, you know, personally to kind of express myself. And that's kind of what I was doing here as well. This was kind of how I was dealing with everything that was happening at the same time, personally, was, uh, you know, going out and photo photographing every day and being part of the protests. And that was my way of expressing myself. And that was kind of what fuel fueled me uh, for those weeks of being out there protesting and taking photos. And yeah, and that's something, you know, I've been doing with photography. That's not unique to this. You know, I use photography to express myself. And this was a time where I could express myself and also use it for a larger purpose as well. Oh, that that's so clear, Joshua. And I you know connecting again with what everyone is saying and what, what you're bringing through words to your work, I was thinking about how um, your words are really laying bare the fundamentals of visual literacy for the audience and how every technology, every camera, every camera angle is embedded in a particular cultural, political and economic context. And again, how the formal attributes of your photographs from camera angle to, again, your use of uh, repetition to uh, hiding and um, the um, identity of the protesters um, are decisively visually aesthetically different than um, images that we might see by let's say news outlets where um, they are incredibly um, funded by major corporations and how your images are really testimony that each and every, every, each and every one of us um, have agency. Artists have agency to contribute to um, the visual dialogue that our country is participating in. So, you know, thank you again for your photographs and words. I would like to, uh, if we can, scroll through the images a bit more and and take a look at some others. Just to add something to what Gina was saying, I mean, artists have agency 
and people have agency and it's artists who are willing to kind of take off the artist hat and wear the demonstrator hat, wear the marcher hat, you know, um, that's just so crucial because like, there's not going to be like no one, um, just like, you know, there's so many slogans that circulated over the summer and some version of like, you know, we're not going to be saved by anyone. Like we have, we're, we're doing this work ourselves. Like we're out here, you know, the police aren't going to reform themselves. Like the city isn't going to take care of this just because they're all you know good professionals at the top of things. Like we're doing this because we have to do this. If we don't do this, it's not going to get done. I think the same goes for artists. Like if you're, um, like no one is gonna make a representation of these protests um, who isn't a part of it. Um, they, they might photograph, you know, they might make a, you know, obviously photojournalists will do their thing. You might have a documentarian or two who comes out to do their thing. But the only people who tell the story from the side of the people on the ground with the intimacy, with the familiarity, even just with Joshua, what you said about feeling safe, like, um, like I'm not photographing for the most part, I, I felt safe when I was, um, you know, there, um, you know, like that, that's something that just comes from being on the side that is on the ground. Like that comes from actually being protected by other people. And, um, there's no other way to produce an image, um, or to record an event, um, uh, with that sense of familiarity and care and intimacy um, and kind of comradeship. It just doesn't, you can't do it from the outside um, and no one's going to do it for us. You know, there won't be a great archive. Uh, there won't be a MoMA exhibition. You know, there won't be an International Center for Photography exhibition. Um, it's just not going to happen. So I, I don't mean to interrupt the scrolling through the website. We should definitely look at more of these images. Um, they're great. But yeah, Daniel, I'm kind of piggybacking off of that, just uh, seeing the unity that was uh, that was uh, there as well. And, you know, there would be days where people were passing out, out masks, you know, to people that didn't have masks, you know, there'd be days where people were passing out water, drinks, you know, keeping people hydrated. It was that type of unity that I, you know, that made me feel safe. I'm like, okay, you know, as a protester and also just as a photographer out there. Josh, this is Larry. I really like how you capture the collective and how you capture some even independently, but people are reactionary. And I'm saying it from this perspective, you had to react to the people as the people reacted to the protest. How did the people react to you as a photographer when you were going to take these pictures? Because oftentimes you, you have people that they're so focused and you really caught the people that are focused, but sometimes people are so anti being having their picture taken because they don't know what the bottom line is for taking that picture. So how do you feel that people, you react to the people? So, so there wasn't, wasn't too many, uh, too many times where uh, people, you know, showed that they didn't want to be photographed. There were a couple of times, you know, people cover their face or kind of walk away and I respected that. I'm like, okay, let me go somewhere else, you know, and photograph. And once again, I try not to get too many in, like I try not to get in anybody's face. I didn't want to, I didn't want to kind of just insert myself into, you know, there were times where, you know, there were chants or people talking I didn't want to like just go right up in front of them, start photographing them and getting in their way. Once again, I didn't want to take away from the message at all. So I would, you know, stay back a little bit, be a part of the crowd and try to photograph them from there and photograph things from there. And also that kind of plays into like my point of trying to show the scope as well, going for wider angles and showing how many people were there instead of just individuals as well. But, uh, you know, trying to be respectful, you know, there was only just a, maybe a couple of cases where people clearly showed signs of, hey, I don't want to be photographed. And I always try to respect that. Joshua, I had a question just because um, we're looking at this great pairing of images on the screen from the State House. How, how did you think about the police in, in your 
work here. I mean, there, there are a couple moments um, and I, I'm now I'm trying to like, remember like, is, are we looking at the state house, right? Like, are we looking at the state house on a day where the police did X or Y or Z? And I can't often figure it out. Like you're, the, the photographs kind of don't really dramatize what the police are doing um, at, any, at any moment. And I just wondered how you, how you sort of thought about where they sat in relation to, to the, the larger kind of documentary impulse behind the project. I saw them as some uh, something that was always looming over. So when uh, people were protesting on walk, the police were always, you know, not far behind, following them and kind of, I guess, waiting or you know, waiting for something to happen or giving them a reason to, you know, you know, retaliate or do something. But uh, for the most part, during the day, uh, a lot of you know, the protesters were just there organized and with a purpose and the police at the state house specifically were there, I assume to just protect the state house and kind of just stand there and I guess protect the state house from, you know, from anybody coming in and stepping forward. And it was interesting kind of just seeing, it's one of those things where I got a lot of, you know, perspective from, you know, protesters and that side, the police were kind of, you didn't get, you know, I won't say you wouldn't get too much emotion from them, kind of just blank, kind of just there, just there, you know, as a presence. Like, Especially you know, looking at the photograph on the right. So just for people who weren't there, there were like lots of police downtown, obviously, but the state house, the, the people guarding the state house. I can't remember if they were state troopers or wh whoever they were. They weren't CPD. So there's sort of like a a distinction there. Like the the guy at the very far right with the hat on. Um, yeah, that wouldn't be a Columbus police officer. Um, if we could go down a couple images, there's one in particular I'm looking for, and I just would love to hear Joshua's thoughts. Just keep. If we could keep scrolling until, so there are the bike cops, the guard. Yeah, it's these photographs. I'd I'd love to hear you talk about these, and it's sort of a shame that it's so. I mean, I I like the way that the website was put together. So this isn't a knock on the website, but it's hard to see quite what is at the center of the photograph on the left, where there's clearly like something happening. And um, you know, it, if if you take your time with the exhibition, you can zoom in and see that it's um, a, a kind of mixed group. It's protesters, it's media gathered around um, a pretty high-ranking CPD um, mm -hmm. officer named I think Jennifer Knight, who is going to say something, or it's a little bit unclear in the photograph what she's doing. And I just this seemed like such a interesting. Um, opportunity maybe to talk about not just not really like like there's the ethics of photographing protesters but there's also the politics of portraying the police in a moment where the police are at issue right so I, I would love to hear you talk about this photograph and the one next to it um, because it it's such an interesting and not obvious view of the police um, at, a, at a totally intense moment yeah so this was this photo I wanted to kind of showcase one little bit of the craziness that was happening. And this is, you know, may not be able to really tell from the photo, but this is on the move. This is like a march happening at this time, which is a little hard to photograph, by the way, I'm moving and photographing, but uh, but uh, I believe in, and thank you for, you know, naming her Officer Knight, uh, came out to speak to some of the, uh, some of the uh, protesters and, I believe just kind of have dialogue with them. And as this was happening, we we're marching. So you have, because of this, you have the media there, you know, different uh, news groups there. And you also have independent media and a lot of people just, you know, a lot of people with cameras this day in particular, like, and this is just like a little bit of it, but there's people, you know, to the left, to the right with cameras, video cameras, there is a lot happening when it came to the media this day. 
And I kind of wanted to showcase, you know, a wide shot of kind of like the craziness of that in particular. And of the officer, you know, coming out and talking to the protesters, which I found, you know, once again, I found unique. I hadn't seen that. I think this was maybe, I'm trying to remember which day this was exactly. I believe it was later in the first week or the beginning of the second week. Yeah, 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 I think you're right. And uh, it was something I hadn't seen yet. You know, we hadn't really seen that yet. And I just found that very unique. So I wanted to photograph that moment and, and make that a part of the exhibit. That was very important to me. Thinking about what was what Gina was saying with regard to, you know, the like the politics of the camera angle, for example, like here, it just seems so important that, you know, your camera is, and you yourself, the, you know, the position of the photographer, the position of the viewer um, are re removed enough from the scrum, you know, the, the tightly packed group of people um, so that we have this sort of almost, it's not panoramic distance, but it's like a distance where we can sort of see all the actors at play, you know, we see the um, police officer, we see, you know, a, a group of protest leaders around her, we see the wider crowd, we see a protester on the left carrying a sign, we see the photographers, we, you know, we see the official press, we see maybe some more amateur press or photojournalists or what have you. And I, um, yeah, I, I think it's important to sort of pick up on this aspect of the photograph where it's like, you know, whatever is, whatever the police are doing, whatever the strategy is, um, you know, uh, on this particular day that requires a particular officer to speak and address the crowd, but also to address the media, you know, to create an opportunity for a close up and for, you know, um, the, all the theatrics of, um, you know, a, an officer addressing the crowd at the march. And you've given us a really different view. You know, this is a view that I don't want to say it's a skeptical view or, or a, um, a kind of oppositional view, but it's not, it's not the close up view. And it's not the view that this sort of media event was meant to produce. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the politics of that are, are real. Um, the, the, the photo sort of holds open the possibility that we might not be convinced by whatever it is that she has to say, or maybe we can't even hear it, you know. Um. And uh, yeah, and I do, every time I look at this photo, I always wonder if there's an even wider shot of somebody else who was taking a photo behind me and that I'm in. <laughs> That's just kind of, just a part of the, you know, the media or, you know, photographers as well. But uh, yeah, and this was, once again, this was, you know, a little bit later into the protest. And one of my own personal gripes was like, okay, there should be more dialogue between uh, police officers and protesters and the city itself for that matter. And this was the first day where there was that, that was actually happening. And from that kind of, a lot of this kind of erupted. And I just wanted, you know, once again, wanted to showcase what was happening, you know, in the middle there, but also the craziness that was still happening around it. Maybe we can scroll just a little more down. Yeah. I love how you captured the text, like the language part of it, you know? There's so much um, room for dialogue and speech and, and narrative, um, and it's so prevalent in all the images. And one thing that's not too prevalent in the, uh, this exhibit in particular was just a lot of the uh, art that uh, popped up around uh, Columbus, downtown Columbus, all throughout high, all down High Street as well and to where like it wasn't just you know me as a photographer coming out to express myself there were art other artists and so many other people that are coming out to express themselves in different ways as well just could you this is larry could you speak a little bit about that i mean because originally you were doing shots of the movement as far as the march was concerned and the protest was concerned but you did a unique thing of saying i'm going to tie the arts in as a part of this 
I'm going to not only concentrate from the photography aspect of it, I'm going to concentrate now on some of the visual artists and the statements that they had to make. And some of the statements were just very proactive. I mean, there's never been a movement of any type without art being a part of it. And with that reality, I think he did a very good job of going out and taking pictures throughout uh, for the exhibit for the uh, protest and for the exhibit to a degree, because I think a lot of these pictures are going to be taken down and they're going to be used in, in a different way uh, as part of the protest. So could you talk a little bit about the pictures that you took, the aesthetic pictures that you took as far as uh, the paintings? Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, it's kind of another reason why I wanted to really document what was happening. And because, you know, on the other side, there was you know, this art aspect to the protests that was happening, you know, all throughout High Street and downtown Columbus that I wanted to showcase. And it was something that I hadn't seen before, like that much art. And, you know, during this time period, during this month, if you drove down High Street, like you were, you were in for a treat. Like you saw some, some incredible artwork, some great artwork. And just, you know, the photos that I used here, there's, you know, a lot of art that was out there. I chose these in particular because of, you know, the, uh, the purpose of these and the names. I kind of wanted to keep it there with, you know, for the art that I show, you know, George Floyd, Tyree King, Henry Green, Julius Tate Jr. and uh, Breonna Taylor and just make sure that they were recognized kind of like this is the reason why everything was happening. But the amount of art, this is just a sliver like, so I, uh, kind of tried to archive those, uh, a lot of the pieces as well. And I took over, I wanna say 80 photos, like 80 different pieces just all around Columbus. It was, it was, it was pretty wild and it was, it was beautiful and it was something I had not seen before. And yeah, shout out to all the artists out there because that was some beautiful artwork. And it's my understanding, just as a follow up from that, that the uh, Greater Columbus Arts Council has been working to save these um, boards and that in fact they're going to go on display throughout the city. Um, I think in this coming year, there are a couple of sites <clears throat> that they're planning for and um, I think they're hoping to display them, not just, you know, downtown where the protests took place, but across the city, perhaps in places where people did not get to see um, this particular work. Maybe just to um, point to a side of this project that kind of raises some political questions or questions around representation that I think are actually really hard to answer for any of us, I think. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this as a sequence of images, there is a sort of endless quality. Uh, it's as much as Joshua structured it, the exhibition chronologically, um, they don't really read that way. I mean, part of that is that they, they um, again, sort of refuse a lot of the conventions of you know, photojournalism. So it's, it's hard to actually pin individual images down to a particular set of events. And there's no real climax. And of course, many of these marches many of these um, days of protest had real kind of climactic moments with clashes with the police, which are not really represented here. Um, I guess I'm, I'm thinking, at least from my vantage, like there's something about the, the, this idea of um, this body of work as fragmentary and as sort of open-ended um, uh, that points to an aspect of the unrest over the summer that really just can't be adequately represented. I don't mean it can't be represented, um, but um, you know the um, you know what can be represented is what we have a name for. So we have a name for um, a, a riot, or we have a name for um, you know the police um, you know unloading tear gas or whatever. We don't really have a name for um, you know the refusal of order. Um, uh, you know, unrest is a name for that. Um, but um, I, I think it's really hard to depict unrest. I mean, I think it's, it's not impossible to depict protest. Protest is sort of a moment of unrest. Um, but, um, you know, in, in a way, the, the kind of 
trauma, traumatic and traumatizing aspects of the protests of the summer aren't really in these photographs. You know, I don't, I don't see the, the, you know, protesters blinded by um, chemical spray. Like I don't see the wounds to people's bodies. Um, I don't, I don't see the screaming, which was like the, the kind of um, sound that accompanied some of the more kind of, you know, crazy or wild moments when police really became very violent. Um, and I, but I, I'm not trying to say that that's a negative here that like, it's bad that the photographs don't show those things. I don't know that those things can be depicted. Like, I don't know that images are, can, can, um, I don't even know if it would be a good thing if they could be represented, because if they could represent, be represented, then they, they would have names, they would have categories, we'd be able to put them in order. And the breach of order is something that exceeds all of that. So to me, I sort of see in the cracks between these photographs, the, the disorder. And I kind of appreciate that the sequential character of the of the, the project, the fact that we, we go from a kind of moment of rest or a moment of sort of safety to another moment of safety, but you kind of know that between these moments of safety is something very unsafe. Those shields are real shields. I mean, they're quite heavy um, and were made to defend people's bodies, you know, um, and in between moments where it felt like, okay, we can kind of check our cell phones and like put the rest, rest on the shield for a little while. Um, were just moments of uh, kind of unrepresentable violence and confusion and just all the sound and smell that comes with that. And, um, I think it's a strength of this body of work that, that you sort of know that that's there and you don't see it and, and that you didn't try to take the camera and make that sort of absence of order a picture. I really appreciate that impulse. Um, yeah, now I'm speaking on unrest I do agree it's something that's hard to capture but as for me and maybe for you you know from being down there it's easy to feel like the unrest is and uneasiness is very very easy to feel and like I said you know this was this is just a fragment of what happened these are just you know 20 photos and, you know, even out of these 20 photos, I took hundreds of photos, you know, I picked 20 for the exhibit. And in doing so, like, things are left out. But once again, this is, you know, just fragments of what I saw when I was there. And that's kind of the story I tried to tell. And, you know, other things you saw, there was a little bit of there are things you felt, you know, during it, especially, you know, living downtown, the, the constant helicopters, you know, flying overhead, you know, only have a little bit of uh, like the National Guard, a Humvee and everything, but the National Guard was occupied in downtown Columbus for a good week. Like that was a solid week. Uh, uh, you know, they used the uh, parking lot of COSI for their Humvees. And, you know, that was, that's a part of it. There was just, so much there and that's kind of you know why i say we need a lot of photographers to you know showcase whatever they see on a daily basis because it's all part of the story and even if you know what the media shows is also part of the story even if you know, the media may have their own their own you know injection into it as well but it's also part of the story it's also what's happening they may just show just that and yeah, so, you know, it's kind of taking everything that you see and combining it and making it a part of the story. Problem is a lot of people don't always do that and aren't capable of doing that when it comes to, you know, they, the first thing they see is the first thing that they judge. And that's the first thing that they kind of go to, you know, in talking about the protests moving forward. And yeah, so yeah, it's, it, it's a hard thing, but it requires, you know, everything coming together to get the full story. I'm, this is Marine. I'm looking at the clock. I want to make sure, because we're at the hour now, um, that we also uh, answer most of the audience's questions. I 
I think we have, I think the last question that I see here um, talks about what expectations you might have for Ohio State in particular in terms of art and these protest movements, um, you know, in terms of Black Lives Matter or the LGBTQ movements or immigration rights. What, what would you like OSU to do? Did you have any particular expectations there at all when you were making this body of work? Uh, so I didn't have any expectations as far as what I expected from OSU or any uh, you know corporation or company at that time. I do think the reaction was very hopeful at that time. You know, I don't know about any of you, any of you but like I got so many, you know, so much spam email during the span of this time from, from like random corporations, from, you know, Macy's saying we stand with Black Lives Matters, you know, just like decisions that you, you know, may not be genuine. They may just be trying to jump on it, you know, while it's happening, but still sending, you know, trying to send some support. I appreciate it, you know, that I guess. But uh, I would say OSU, the way, you know, a lot of things that are happening right now at OSU, I do appreciate. And, you know, with me working in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and seeing a lot of the work that is happening and a lot of people coming to us to uh, kind of start a lot of work and also, you know, work with us and collaborate and asking questions, that has been extremely hopeful. And that has been, that has been, you know, one of the best parts of, you know, my job at OSU, working to offer diversity and inclusion and seeing that and seeing that change. And once again, goes back to, it's something I hadn't seen before, like just the reaction and people being like, something has to be done and trying to have those conversations. So I'm seeing a lot more of that. I wanna open this last moment up to the panel and see if there are any other points or questions um, that you would like to address. Well, it's great. It's terrific but, having, go ahead. Well, yeah, Josh, the one thing I just wanna appreciate and a lot of people don't know, not only did you do the protest that was downtown, but the other aspect is you did it when the students had their own protests in June here. And uh, I think what you did was inspirational because now students can be a part of that march, even if they didn't go downtown, they had a safer march here on campus and were able to articulate their concerns and show their support in a different way. Downtown, you had thousands of people, but here you had uh, at OSU, you had hundreds. So you were one of the few people that were able to capture the city and also capture the university. And I think that makes for a great exhibit. So I commend you on that. Thank you. And that's also, that has me very hopeful as well, just uh, seeing the students' reactions as well and kind of the confidence that they have to stand up for themselves and, you know, see protests as a viable option, you know, for, you know, since then, there's been other issues as well that, you know, they're standing up for and protesting and just so many things that it's just nice that they see that as a viable option and can express themselves in that way. And yeah, you know, students at OSU have a lot of fight in them and a lot of, uh, just a lot of determination. And, you know, I love that. Just in the last seconds, I would, um, I would just plug a letter written by OSU student government over the summer, I think in June, um, weighing in on the question of the Columbus Police Department. Um, it's worth educating yourself about that letter and those demands if you haven't um, seen it already. And then I just also want to say justice for Walter Wallace Jr. and solidarity with um, the people in Philly who are out saying his name. Um, there's a lot of work left to do. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And talking about uh, you know what's going on in Philly right now, that's it's one of those things while I was photographing a lot of what was happening in Columbus, it's it's a sadness as well, because you know this isn't the last time. Like you just know from over the years, like it's become a thing where you know it's gonna happen again and again. And you know it's gonna continue ha to happen. And yeah, but the seeing people, you know, unify and rise up 
that's kind of like, that's where I'm getting hope from. Seeing what happened in Columbus over the summer, what's happening in Philadelphia right now. And yeah, things have just happened around the world. People are more, you know, protest and using their voice is becoming a viable option that people are really using specifically this year. And it's something I'm, yeah, I'm very happy about. Thank you so much, um, everyone who attended and also panelists, uh, Joshua, Danny, Gina, Larry. Um, I like this message of hope, you know, as a, as a kind of ending point, I think it's really critical. It's important that we go with that hope and courage and um, pull it all together. And, and your photographs just tell the story really beautifully. Um, so I appreciate the conversation today and um, you telling us more about sharing your, your thoughts and, and, and essentially what was going through your mind as you were um, protesting, but also taking these images. And this goes for all of our panelists. Thank you for your very candid conversation today. Really appreciate it. For, um, for those who are watching uh, the work, uh, Joshua's work can be found online on the Ohio State uh, Urban Art Space website at uas.osu.edu. And it'll be up um, through the end of December, I believe. So um, I hope you get to check it out. Um, with that, I'm going to close the conversation. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. And um, thank you. Look forward to connecting with all of you soon.